Wow, thank you for coming. Um, what a good turnout. Um, welcome to the DOCS panel um, for an hour of hopefully lively discussion and uh, proper insight um, with some of the cleverest and most talented um, and um, powerful people in television. Um, and um, there's me as well. Um, I'm Narinda Minhas. Uh, I'm creative director at Sugar Films. Um, I have to say, this is a really interesting moment to be in the dogs community. Um, not only have we got Network and Amazon on the scene, we've got diversity gaining momentum, we've got technology driving innovation, we've got short form, long form, we've got a range of tones. And actually, I think more interestingly, we've got a moment where um, there seems to be uh, that there seems to be a sort of a, a, a kind of um, uh, less of a convergence actually where the where the broadcasters are slightly separating out um, and partly driven by the whole thing about imp in the mechanism from channel four but you really get a sense that people are people are much more worried about the branding that they've got distinguishing themselves from the rest of the market um, with me are Guy Davis, who's commissioning editor of Factual Joe Clinton Davis who's controller of Factual ITV uh, Lisa Pomeroy, who's commissioning editor at Channel 4, and uh, Claire Sillery, who's uh, head of docs at uh, the BBC. Um, I want to kick off with Guy, really. In this first bit, we really ask people to compile some highlights, not necessarily like a, a polished <coughs> showreel of, of stuff, but really the sort of films that they would like to, to highlight. So could we just kick off with the Channel 5 yeah. highlights? So, Guy, Michael Palin on North Korea. Yep. Is this the new Channel 5? Well, I think, uh, for me, that little uh, tape uh, sort of represents the range of what we do, really. Um, so, I think that the story for Channel 5 is one of growth, really, in documentary. Um, trying to be as broad appeal as possible. Uh, trying to engage as big an audience as we can trying to take everything from uh, cocaine, Britain's uh, epidemic, the sex business that we did recently, um, right through to uh, cruising with Jane McDonald, two million on Friday night, to uh, big prestige projects like uh, Michael Palin in North Korea, which is obviously a great coup, um, especially in the light of today's strange announcements from Donald Trump. So, um, yeah, I think it's about range for us and about growing up as a channel. Uh, documentary is at the heart of the popular schedule. It's, um, I mean, we have, at 8 o'clock, we have a raft of shows which are all popular documentary. Um, Yorkshire Vet, Dog Rescuers, GPs, long-running, high-volume shows, which I, I suppose effectively are our soaps for that 8 o'clock slot. Um, and, yeah, so it's, uh, for me, it's, a, it's about range. No, it is an incredible range, actually. So how did you get uh, Palin, or how did that come about, that particular project? Uh, well, it's a very long story. It took two years to do, and I, all I'm going to plug uh, relentlessly here is that we, at 4.30 this afternoon, we have a session with the director uh, where we're going to show a little bit more of that. Uh, so I don't want to go too much into that, other than it took uh, two years to work it through. Um, it went right up the chain inside North Korea, to get uh, a full crew in with Michael. Uh, Michael's been amazing and great fun. Uh, and I hope just that little taster there will whet people's appetite. But yeah, it's been a massive project for us, a big prestige project for us, yeah. I sort of noticed uh, a change in the kinds of presenters that you're using on, mm. on Five. Would you say that's been a conscious move? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I think uh, you know, the way that we see Channel Five's appeal, as I say, is broad. Um, and I think that part of that is having a presenter roster that does two jobs. I think, firstly, it's uh, very wide in appeal. So we would, you know, the Ben Fogels, the Jane McDonalds, Michael Portillo on the channel, Michael Palin on the channel. They feel like a, ch a grown-up channel, uh, and that's really important for us. But I think also it's about matching presenters to the right shows so that we get, we get our audiences. Um, where we score is where we get large audiences. So um, I, think, uh, I think, by and large, we're looking for presenters who we feel can appeal, rather than breaking new talent, which I think is much more difficult for us. 
Well, thank, thanks, Guy. Um, just moving to Joe, I want to go straight into these clips, actually. There's quite a lot of these clips to get, get through today, um, uh, and, I, and I think some of them are incredible, and, um, and this is a, a one from my TV. An amazing range, actually. It's so funny. So why did you choose these particular clips? What do you think well, that's about? Well, I think it is about the range. I think there are each of them a sort of big, in the case of the Royal Full Monty, literally ballsy um, propositions <laughs> that feel bigger than the sum of their parts, that are inherently marketable. <coughs> each one of them is about something. Each one of them gives you an insight into a world that we think big, broad audiences are curious about. And commissioning for ITV is quite a hard gig because it is about broad, big audiences. There's nowhere to hide. We commission into 9 o'clock. So we have to attract people in to really strong titles and to worlds that we think they are going to want to be part of and, to shed a, and we shed a light on them. And at the same time, then we can deliver the intelligence, the complexity, the nuance, but it's getting them there. So in the case of The Real Full Monty, I mean, what I love about that show um, that uh, I commissioned and Kate brilliantly uh, uh, sort of took over and looked after and it's now turned into Full Monty Ladies Night and, you know, it's an, a returning brand. It's a stunt in the schedule, but it's about something. If they'd have pitched, if Spangold had pitched, let's do testicular and prostate cancer and we can do it with a performance of Full Monty at the end, that wouldn't have worked. But actually, it was one of those things that felt like an instant no-brainer, wrong part of the anatomy, um, when uh, it was the anniversary of The Real Full Monty, let's do The Real Full Monty. Then I said, how are we going to get people to it, to be part of it, to take their kit off, and what's it about? Because I think all factual, whether you're factual entertainment, I, you know, this is about a range of factual, whether you're factual entertainment or serious documentary, has to be about something, has to be about something that matters to people, that has an instant connection. So actually marrying the full Monty, the, the show, and the proposition to the sort of raising awareness about male health, prostate and testicular cancer, was not only a way of getting talent involved who had a connection to the subject, but actually making it purposeful. Crime and punishment, I don't think it had, and we had no branding on there, how professional are we, you know, but anyway, a tape. Um, but uh, crime and punishment was a way of taking a territory that we know has always worked for the audience. Other channels have now found that it also works for them. We used to have a heritage of series based in prisons and, and, and we made it great in some of its parts and then we had faces of crime, all of whom had an authentic connection to the subject. So when we did Trevor McDonald um, actually interviewing Je uh, Denise Fergus, James Bulger's mother, that was extraordinary. That felt to us something really important. He'd reported on that case. She had never done that interview. So it's something inherently special, but by, by corralling the films about crime and punishment together and creating a roster of talent who could take us into these worlds, it felt big, and that's what we're about. And then you're not going to say no to the Queen and David Attenborough, are you? I mean, no, you know, I mean, not even in my densest moments am I going to turn that down. I, I would. I know. Um, so, I mean, that's about amazing, extraordinary access. You know, and that's wonderful. And we do, you know, we do Royal Access. We did, the, the highest rating film we did was Diana, Our Mother, Her Life and Legacy, which with uh, the two princes. I mean, what a coup, a royal coup, if you like, talking about Diana, which was amazing, and I think it sort of netted 40 million. But I, in the end, it's also about finding worlds that we can get in all shapes and sizes, you know, whether it's, finding a different way into familiar yeah. territory. Well, some of these themes will come up uh, a little later on, uh, Joe. Just, just on, on how broad mm -hmm. uh, things should be. I mean, how, how did these particular programs rate? Or uh, what, 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 what are we talking about uh, okay. in terms of ratings as a good the, factual the, show? The Real what Formandy Ladies Night got just shy of six million. Um, so that's a pretty damn good figure. I think it's 28% uh, uh, share. Um, uh, Crime and Punishment, the Becky Watts film, which is a way of coming at... What I like is both access, which is great, 
but also coming at stories in a different way. So we did a series called, uh, we did a film called Police Tapes. We did The Murder of Becky Watts, Police Tapes. So Police Tapes is coming back because it was a way into understanding the police process, which I think audiences like. That rated about five consolidated. Okay. The uh, Inside Death Row, you know, these, these are all big So that's a serious shows. subject. How would that have done then? What's Inside Death Row, all our crime and punishment have rated really, really right. well. There was only one film that, you know, I, I, anomalous uh, sort of ratings thing that didn't do quite so well, um, mainly because it had been covered a lot in the news. Um, so, but they've, they're all really, really high ratings. And the Queen's Green Planet did, you know, although it's a film about the environment and trees, yes. did about six. Six as well, right, okay. Um, so moving on to uh, Elisa at uh, Channel 4, uh, we can go straight into the, the Channel 4 highlights. Amazing clips, um, incredibly funny, some of them. Um, Game, what, what do you think unites them, actually? Because they are quite different as well, at one level. Well, I think they're sort of story that they tell, particularly 24 hours in police custody and first dates, is, for, as you all know, it's been a year of massive change for Channel 4, and it's, that has obviously brought its challenges. But the thing that's really surprised us about the last year is this kind of ripening of our long-running series. Sometimes at points at which we thought maybe we'll have to retire some of them, they've suddenly just grown. And if you look at 24 hours in police custody, that's on its sixth series. We would <coughs> never have got that story six series ago. It's taken that long to build up the trust with the police force, and it feels like those sort of long-term bets have really paid off. Same with um, um, First Dates Hotel. That started off six years ago. The first program didn't do very well, got 700,000 viewers, but we backed it and backed it and backed it, decided to do it abroad. The first First Dates Hotel didn't do that well, but then we decided to do it again, and it got better, and we improved it. And I think that's sort of the success story of the last year. Um, there's one in there, actually, which hasn't been transmitted, Prison, which is a new big access series, which is Paddy Wivell in HMP Durham, which is a very kind of unique viewpoint on <laughs> a prison, very mm. comedic. Um, but I suppose what unites them is the f relevance and purpose, um, and they've all got something slightly different about them, have a sort of Channel 4 um, spin. You've, you've included a, a drama doc. Um, mm. Is that a growth area or is that...? It's not a growth area, but it's something that we really value. We're only able to do a few of them every year, but it's a really good way to get documentary talent to try their hand at fiction and drama, so we're definitely open for business on that one. OK. Uh, I mean, I, I've, I've noticed, actually, in a, in a broad sense, that um, drama is, is really key. I mean, I've watched the growth of 24 Hours in Custody, and I think... They're, they're like watching dramas now. They really are. They're incredibly well made and highly polished, actually. I mean, do you, when do you, when do you, when's the moment when you kind of drop a brand? Or I mean, is it, is it, do you feel like there's more life in that, in in, that area? In 24 hours in police custody? Yeah. Definitely. I mean, I don't know if... You, I don't know, our, the figures are kind of... Uh, some of our episodes are getting 2.5 million. The, the, all of the episodes are better than before. I mean, I don't know whether it's relevant to drama. I mean, I think the whole drama thing is quite intriguing, and I imagine that it, it will sort of go full circle and we'll start seeing much more rough and ready documentaries. I mean, what I really liked about Hospital on BBC Two is it wasn't, didn't feel too um, manicured. It mm. felt quite mm -hmm. urgent and raw. So I don't know whether that's a trend that will continue. I think there'll probably be a backlash at some but point. But do documentary needs drama in it. Doc, real life is stranger than fiction, yeah. and it, you know, it's a wonderful thing to see dramas unfold. And there is something about returning brands, whether it's sort of Love Island that just upped its game, or we had a Long Lost Family, really, or What Happened Next, it wasn't a new brand, but it did the best Long Lost Family, What's Happened Next, you know, since we began that series. So there is something about also the returnable brand, as well as, and upping the ante on that, as well as the new, but I think, Drama can be inherent in, should be inherent in documentary, whether it's made rough and ready or whether it's beautifully polished. It's that that keeps you on the edge of your seat and keeps the narrative going. Um, let's go to uh, Claire. Um, could we just play the, the BBC clips? Mm. 
<laughs> that is such a good line. Um, Claire, well, I, I, those, are, those are incredible clips, but one of the things that I've noticed just generally in terms of the BBC output is just a, m a desire for more humour and, and just, a, again, a, ra a real range of tone, actually, and yeah, a lightness of touch, which you don't always associate in the past with BBC docs. Yes, I think that's true. I, I, I picked those clips for slightly... Do you mind if I run through sure, them? Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. I picked them for quite specific reasons so that you could make sense of some of the steers that we give, because this time last year we were talking about timeliness and scale and ambition. And um, Stephen, the murder that changed the nation, uh, that's what we mean by that. And I think that's what that had for BBC One. And although it was a, it's a story which was um, 25 years old, obviously it's a live story. And um, uh, it, it was incredibly impactful as a story and resonant with Knife Crime and Windrush and made by James Rogan and On the Corner Productions. And, Anyway, scaly, uh, timeliness and scale and ambition, that's something that we will always go for. And you see it in hospital. And we've got another series coming up on BBC Two called School, which is um, inside a multi-academy trust. And, uh, but that's what we mean when we, say, when we say that. And I think you know, the idea that three parts on BBC One with one story mm -hmm. gives you a sense of how we do scale. And the reason that um, I chose the second clip, which is the mighty red car, that hasn't gone out yet. Um, some of you may have seen the preview of it, um, which, was, which was here a couple of days ago. Um, that's made by 72 films, and um, it's going out in July on BBC Two. And, you know, access docs are our sort of bread and butter, and we do all sorts of access docs across all four channels, actually. But from things like Ambulance, which have drama on BBC One, to The Met on BBC One, to um, IKEA, oh, I don't think we called it IKEA, Flatpak Empire on BBC Two. Uh, thank you, editorial policy. <laughs> um, and um, uh, all the way to things like Drugs Land on BBC Three. So we do access docs. But um, what's interesting about something like Red Car, it's a different type of access doc because it's it's life in a northern town. It isn't an institution. And there are sort of two other, there are a few other things we would now say as well as timeliness and scale that we're looking for. And one of them is very much, you know, all the ideas that are coming into us, we're looking for um, diverse voices, voices that you don't hear very often that haven't been represented. And that's sort of what Red Car is about. Um, that and another thing which is about um, finding ideas which don't exclude a young audience. So it's not deliberately targeting a young audience, but it's ideas which won't make them think that's just not for me, which is sort of the idea behind Red Car. Um, and then the final clip is what, it, it, Frankie goes to Russia. Um, Brilliant. Is funny. <laughs> He's really funny. Yeah. And what we want in tone and what we're missing in tone, we're looking for a real... Uh, variety in tone and we're looking for a bit more mischief and opinion and I don't quite know is the is scabrous the right pronunciation of what <laughs> scabrous scabrous anyway do you know it's a kind of, it, it, it it's a very special mix in the tone that that Frankie brings and is sorry just going back to red car is that is that a uh, what is it a three-parter or sorry a, it's a four-part series right right four by 45 minutes so shot over a year with, with his shot over um, a little more than a year and a half to Two years, yes. Shot by um, Dan Dewsbury in Red Car. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Actually, um, it'd be incredible. Um, it's got that sort of shameless Channel Four quality about it. Or what's really interesting? Yeah. They've made some really interesting stylistic choices in it. Of um, the voiceover is by a local girl. Um, the uh, the music in it is really distinctive. It's got a very distinctive look um, and tone. I think. Yeah. So. No. Um, it's something which I think is quite a significant tone marker for us, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Well, th th thank you for that. Um, we, I just want to move into, or to have a, a gear change now, really, J just move into something that I think uh, all of us indies kind of obsess about, which is uh, tasters. Um, there's been a kind of growth in the sort of taster business, if you like. Um, but as, a, as an indie producer, you're never sure whether you should be sending it in, how polished it should be, whether it should be shot properly. Uh, is it okay to send in a few captions with some interview material? Is it okay to send it on an iPhone? Um, so what we did was ask uh, these guys to pick out a couple of tasters 
that have come in uh, recently, uh, and it will be interesting to see what's happened to them and what it was about those tasters actually that um, moved them potentially to, to, to a commission. So could we just start with uh, Guy, and I, I just wanted to go into, straight into a clip which is called uh, Single Mum, Super Mum. <laughs> so, guy, is that is that a pa is that a paid taster, or did that? How did uh, that there was, Yeah, actually, there was a very small amount of the seed money that went into that, just to do it in time. Um, I mean, I mean, I can talk about our, the channel's attitude to tasters. Yeah, please um, do. And then I can talk about that if you like. Um, uh, well, actually, why don't I talk about that first? Because I can tell you why it's a great taster. Um, is that what you're looking for? I think is uh, an idea, a reason to do it, and a kind of feeling of it, t of it tying in to what you as a commissioner, or in this case Daniel, who's doing it, uh, w what's, the, what's the kind of thing, that gut feeling about the channel? And it's really difficult to get that over to everybody when we all talk. You know, it's like, what is it about Channel 5? And it's all bollocks that commissioners talk about when they say, you know, oh, it's like, you know, what is the thing about this? Or what needs that blown through it? But it, there is something in that which is innately Channel 5 at now. And that's because it just, you know, we've got to ask ourselves, and it's our, it's our problem. It's like, what is the story we're trying to tell in our programs? What, what, what are we trying to get out there? And in the, in the age of, you know, the fangs, and I suspect that we are not as uh, much troubled by them in a way as some other channels, but is the, is, is the what's the story of Britain we're trying to tell? And I know this is a cliche that's banded around all the time, but I do think that, that Channel 5 has a particular take on Britain, and uh, the warmth of the spirit of that taster helps define that. So you, I could kind of look at that, and I only had to watch it for a minute to know that it struck that bell straight away. It just has. And it's partly in the way it's done, it's partly in the characters, and it's partly the attitude of the film itself. So you look at it and you think, why, why would we do this? There are stats that back this up. What is it, what's the feel of that? And it's a kind of joy and celebration of being, in this case, you know, a lone mum. And you sort of think, that, you know, how many people out there watching our channel will chime with that? But you're not looking for something polished at this no, point, are you? No, I mean, it's, so that was, that's the editorial reason for that being a great taster, in my view. And, you know, no wonder it got commissioned. Uh, in fact, we announced it today, I think. So, uh, in terms of the policy on, on, on tasters, we're, I think, a bit different. In that, uh, you know, I work for a programme controller who has, who's more like a tabloid editor, in a way, or newspaper editor, really. Knows his paper, knows what should be on every page and actually has very little uh, attention span in terms of long, drawn-out development. What will happen is I'll think, you know, we'll get something in, I'll look at it, I'll think about it, but at the end of the day, if I go and try and say we should do this, but it's going to take three months to work it out, uh, Ben will say, like, actually, you know what, fine. And then a week later, say, what project was that? I'm over that. It's literally that quick. So I can't be in the business of commissioning... 10,000 or 15,000 pound taster tapes. And I think that that is a sign really of where we are in terms of the commissioning policy because I'm much more of a gut instinct person. And my view is if you want to do it, just do it. I mean, by and large, I mean, that is a great tape, yeah. but by and large, we don't have taste, we don't really rely on taster tapes. Okay. Because we just feel like it's either got that thing or it hasn't. And an idea is an idea. And if we want to do it, we'll just do it. Okay. That's our overall feeling. Fair enough. So, Fair enough. so there is, but I still think, you know, things come through. Yeah. People send things in. You can't not watch them. Every now and again, something like Bad Habits was another example last year, just kind of like, yes, caught it. So okay. that's really our policy. All right, well, thanks, thanks for that, Guy. Um, so this is a, a taster from Joe um, and ITV, uh, and it's uh, called Easy Jet. So, again, Joe, how did that arrive at ITV? So, look, uh, this, that was paid development in the end, the, the taster tape. Um, 
and uh, somebody else looked after this, and it's been, but it's done great business for us. And uh, what happened was that ITN came in with the access to EasyJet. Now, EasyJet and airline have been staples of schedules for a long, long time. Airline was a staple of ITV's schedule and airport of the BBC's schedule. Nothing wrong with that. Actually, Heathrow Airport, access all areas, is doing unbelievably well for us. So there's something about finding an iconic place and really taking you behind, you know, backstage. Um, so we're familiar with it and we're going backstage. But I think there were two things that really were attractive about this. It was the decision that actually for the first time ever you could put cameras in the cockpit. So there were two things that made it different. And this is a message I would give to people. You know, just think about different ways in or how to push the boat out. That's the wrong analogy, isn't it, for the aeroplanes? But, um, you know, and here it was, first time ever inside the cockpit. And then rookies, although rookies had been done, but it was a sort of smart way in. But the cockpit cam just took it to a different level. So this was about giving them development money to prove that that was possible and to take EasyJet on the ride with them. And that's a little sample of the result. There was some very, very sort of good, funny moments in there. But, you know, and out of that, a returning brand is made. So I think, like Guy, we are... We love titles at ITV and propositions with clarity that are about something. So if you look at the titles that we do, it's almost like test us for the, for the proposition first, because I don't want people who are under-resourced to have to feel they have to make a perfectly formed taster for us. So there are, you know, it's circumstances alter cases, you know, so you have to think whether you need to prove something. But if you look at the titles that we were excited by, whether it's, you know, Gond Pot that came into Kate with a picture of a very, very famous person uh, smoking a joint that was sort of, it was the title, the subtext, you'll never have trouble with your joints again, and the idea of an immersive uh, vehicle for celebrities, um, but actually a subject that's resonant and relevant because it's about the legalization of cannabis, a subject of now. So that wasn't sold on a taster, um, so I think for us, it's the test the idea first, a really great title. And then if we're interested, we'll go out and say, here's a bit of development money. But, okay. you know, sometimes it works the other ways. The best taster that ever came into me, cold, one of the best, cold, was uh, the taster for an hour to catch a killer. Because that was a fucking great title, actually, an hour to catch a killer that was based on something authentic. And I'm sure we'll all use that, you know, feel that best formats are based on something authentic. And Out to Catch a Killer, it showed the, how the concept would work in the taster. So that was material to the commission. Okay. Um, Elisa, um, this is the, the Channel 4 uh, taster, actually, and it's called uh, the Drag Lab. So what's the story here? How did that come about? I, th I mean, there was quite an interesting methodology behind that taster, and I was really impressed by the company who bought it to me. Tiny, tiny, really struggling indie startup, two people in a room. And um, they, um, they knew that I was looking for something really quite young skewed at 10 o'clock, something returnable. And they went to a local school, and they asked teenagers, what are you interested in? Which I thought was quite impressive to do a little kind of little focus group. And they said... David Attenborough, that's good. Not coming on Channel Four anytime soon, sadly. <laughs> Louis Through, Ditto, and Drag. And so they spent time looking for <laughs> looking for these characters. Have more I of didn't these know focus groups. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know anything yeah. about it. But they went and they shot that tape off on their own money. They showed it to me on a Wednesday morning at ten o'clock, and the next day I commissioned a six-part series. And what I really loved about it was they believed in those characters, they believed they had something, and they went up and they shot it themselves. And a lot of people had talked to me and my colleagues about drag and whether you could bring it and make it quite mainstream and whether you could do something quite f formatted, a formatted doc with it. But they were the people who put their money where their mouth was, and they found people who actually really do it in real life. So it's not a construct. These, this troupe of queens actually do that. 
And um, it just felt like it was quite an alternative perspective and an alternative fresh voice for 10 o'clock. So did they come in with just wanting to make an hour and you turned it into six They didn't hours? know what it was. They sat down, they just said, right. oh, have a look at this. And I said, oh, I'm not that into drag, I'm not sure. Watched it. And my colleagues also watched it and we all loved it. And yeah, commissioned six hours the next day. They didn't wow. know what it was. They had hoped it was a series, but it, we, in discussion, we decided. I'm really hoping that. They would do a sort of Priscilla. Me, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. It's, it's anomalous. It can happen that way, actually. Can it? Well, yeah, it can happen that way because something came into us the other day. And actually, sort of, when we say we don't necessarily canvas tasters, this taster came in. It was a really smart way into. Uh, you know, a mainstream subject, and we took it in, the, you know, it was sort of commissioned the same day, in a way, well, so. Okay, um, there's hope. Um, Claire, uh, so this is uh, uh, a, a, a clip uh, about a New York lawyer. Oh, is it not Girls With Balls? Uh, no, I think we'd start with that second. Okay, issue. so this is sort of the opposite way around to, to the thing that you've just been talking about, because, I brought this, you should just have conviction in things that you really love because this came in and it was just the opposite of everything that we were looking for. There was nothing about this that was on any steer anywhere. But um, if you haven't seen it, it's brilliant and you should so just have watch a look it. Yeah, this. yeah. <laughs> I love that, I love the hair. Um, and what is there not to like? So did that come just like that? Or, wow. That's a good day. <laughs> and, and, you know, we weren't looking for anything like that, but, but we took it into Patrick, and that was commissioned as a four-part series, four by 45. Because, it, you know, you know it promises narrative. You know that you're going to get into courts. You're going to be able to, to follow real narrative story about justice in America. Um, but he is just an extraordinary character. Um, yeah, were there any, were there any concerns about it? I mean, he's obviously amazing, but in terms of turning it into a four-part series? No. Not with the editing team that are on it. And the thing, the thing that it's the confidence with that, you know, sometimes, and we've all been there, you know that thing when you've got something funny and you put that music on that goes, this is funny, and it's like, oh, that plinky music. Um, it didn't have any of that. It's really confident about what it, what it, I, what it is. Mm -hmm. So... Um, yeah. And when's, when's it going out? So anyone who says that commissioning's difficult, it's not really, is it? <laughs> not when I you think get if that. you do get a, a, yeah. a character, you know, even if it's just a little bit of tape, it doesn't have to be a cut piece, yeah. you know, that can be very helpful. Yeah. And your character. job is to think about how to take something, take the bare bones of something, the raw material, yeah. and turn it into something that might fit your channel. And that's a really wonderful creative process, actually. It's a bit of alchemy. And um, that's a fantastic collaboration. So, you know, that's where everybody's in with a chance. Yeah. When you have an idea that you feel passionate about, characters that you think are magical, and our job is to think, how can we shape that with you? I think from the production company's perspective, what was interesting about this, and if someone from Plum is here, you can correct me about this, but I think they were doing work for an American network or possibly some crime work for ITV about yeah. something else. And the development team found this character and cut this tape. So it's really interesting how these things come out of other things. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I mean, uh, he's just so good. I can't wait to see him, actually. Um, <laughs> so, so Guy, next. Uh, th so this is called Casualty 24-7. Yeah, this is, a, uh, again, a short character-driven tape. Okay. Um, that, yeah. Let's go straight into it, actually. <laughs> so, so, again, we've had shows about hospitals yeah. and things. So what, yeah. why, why this? What was because I think, uh, I think it's a really funny tape. And the, what it sort of really triggered was a discussion about what what way in could we take to some to this area that was kind of felt different felt a bit soapy felt but but also you know you, you could you could may have a little bit of a hard edge and i think that going through whether you know whenever you go into a and e you sort of see people you see people gossiping you see people kind of chatting how do they get through the day how do you get through that shift how do you really do it and that became like just a really interesting thing to play with and 
that arrived, and you sort of think, yeah, you know, that is what that life is. That is what that job is. So in a way, we decided to come from the other side of things as a result and make a series which was about the job and about the shift. Uh, and that felt like a fresh way of doing it because it's not just all about the patients, but obviously there's the stories. So it could have a sort of potentially sort of slightly soapy feel but be a bit more grown up. And that felt... That felt interesting, and I think that that's you know that that was a process where it wasn't a sort of you see it one day and you go oh, you just got to have it that's that's it. It was more uh, okay. So how do we use those great characters? We've obviously had a lot of success with Yorkshire this, Yorkshire that, Yorkshire the other, yeah. and uh, it it just sort of thought okay, there's something in those characters. They we can make that work for us for our audience. So it fight again. It kind of felt in tune with what we were trying to do. So, so for you, it, it, the territory could be, could be out there already. It's just yeah, actually it the approach. So it was a, it was a Yeah, approach. and I think that's true of all the broadcasters. Yeah. You know, they're not going to say we're never going to make another police series. Uh, and you know, we've got a number of the, those kind of you know, things in development, and we've got more medical series coming through. But it, yeah, I mean, there are territories that you need to constantly think, how can we just, how can we just tilt this slightly to make it feel right for now and right for our audience. You know, that's the thing. It's like, how do you just take it and make a little bit more of it? Okay, um, so this next clip, uh, and this is uh, from ITV for Joe, uh, is Manson, The Lost Tapes. Wow, what extraordinary archive mm. footage. Ha Who, well, that... Yeah, gosh. That's it now. Um, that came in as, a, as that real. Um, we knew that had been part of a documentary that had been banned never before, and we knew that there were 100 hours more footage that had not been seen of that cult and that event at the time of a 50-year anniversary, but at the same time, with contemporary resonance about the radicalization of young people. <clears throat> I think unseen, untold, unspoken for the first time are good words for ITV and for, you know, when you're doing sort of whether you're doing crime and punishment or whether you're doing something that does require that sort of remarkable, noisy level of access. There's something else in the pipeline around a familiar figure with hundreds of hours of unseen footage made in, this, in a similar way by a documentary maker who had mm. so much passion. And uh, Naked, the production company for Manson, it had been a personal passion project for Simon to hunt down these tapes. So I think passion plus that uniqueness um, and sending in a tape like that is a sort of very potent combination. Probably films have been made in various places about Manson. Lots of films have been made about things, but it's when you find that uniqueness that... Um, Did it arrive with that title, today. Yeah. Um, well, Kate is masterminding this one through, and uh, we both saw the footage at different times, and I think it was that Manson the lost tapes and you know titles can change titles can uh you know but there's a clarity to that pitch i think we both thought it was really chilling um when you see that material it's really chilling mm. but it speaks to you today it's shocking then and it has overtones of meaning that you know just you it, it's that frisson and you want to feel that frisson, whether you're on a sort of... Well, you certainly do with that, that archive. God, mm. the, the interview with the three, three women and the guns and stuff. Yeah. Um, Elisa, so should we just go to um, Channel 4? And this is uh, called Paedophiles' Wives. I didn't want to preempt that and um, um, just, just wanted to play it raw, actually, because... It must have been amazing when you just hear the audio. What, what happened? So just explain. So, it's a bit of a counterintuitive taste because it doesn't have any pictures. 
but the sort of genesis of that project was that Brinkworth Films came to Channel 4 and they really wanted to make a film about what it was like to be married to a paedophile and what that experience was like. And we did a paid development and they found two characters, but they didn't want their face to be shown because they felt so much shame and there, were fear, there was fear of reprisals, etc. And Nick Mursky, who was spearheading the development, um, in collaboration with Brinkworth Films, their attention turns to a film called The Arbor, which quite a, an art house film, which used a technique where they took real sound, documentary sound, but got actors to lip sync to the real documentary sound. And so the question was, with this um, taster, was can we record, can Brinkworth Films record some sound with these women? And will it, will there be, will it feel like something that could work? with lip-syncing actors. And so they recorded it, and um, it, it just felt like something that, that was very alive, and the audio itself was powerful enough, and it felt like this technique could work. And it also, t it was clear that it would work in kind of actuality on the Hoof interview. Sit-down interviews wouldn't quite work. Um, so it was a sort of kind of proof of concept. But I suppose what it shows is that especially with really innovative ideas. You could just film a snippet of something quite odd without pictures. It doesn't have to take a really conventional form of taste to tape. I've always thought sound was more important than picture, um, and this is a really good example of how powerful audio can be. Mm. Um, so, so, Claire, uh, this, is, uh, this is now Girls That's with important. Balls. Um, so we'll go straight into it, actually, because we're pressing... Can I give you just a yeah, tiny yeah, bit of context, just to say that because we have such a range across all the channels, there is sort of room for all sorts of stories and all types of experience, really. And this is a taster from a first-time director that she just did herself, shot in three hours. So, Claire, what, how did this come about? So, um, Gussie, who's a new director, made the taster. She had three hours with the girls. And um, we meet as a development, as a, as a commissioning team, we meet uh, once a week every Monday and we look at tasters together. And all of us felt, you know, I was saying earlier about voices that you don't hear very often or voices that you always hear. Uh, girls from Bradford, it, it's, it's always a grim story or a story about arranged marriages. Or, so it was really refreshing to see a story like this. And, you know, it's, it's not a hugely polished taster, but you know that because there is a competition, there will be enough narrative for a 45-minute film on BBC Three. So that's why that was commissioned. So it's just to say uh, we, it, it is worth sending tasters. It absolutely is, especially if they are characters... Um, who we don't hear from, and you think there is enough narrative. And they don't have to be incredibly polished, do they? I mean, no. it's just that. They don't. And then, you know, we can give you secondary development if, if, if um, that's a question. But there's so much range from with single films all the way across the board on all the channels that it is always worth sending things in. OK, I, I'll be curious, actually, because you guys haven't seen, seen some of these uh, tapes at all. Um, which ones um, you might have been tempted by if they'd landed um, <laughs> through your door. So, Guy, Girls With Balls, would you have gone for that? Is that a Channel 5? I show? wouldn't have gone with that. Uh, I can see why it would be the film you suggest. I don't think it quite would work for me. Uh, I, would have, I would have bitten your hand off for the Manson film. Um, uh, and <laughs> You I can't have it. Probably <laughs> would Get have line. been really interested. <laughs> yeah, I, I would be interested in the paedophile film, but I'm not sure it would have been us. Uh, but I can see why Malcolm would have really wanted to make, wanted to make it, yeah. yeah. Joe, what would you... Well, uh, we like men with balls, really. Um, so we want <laughs> more, you know, so we're absolutely fully committed to real full Monty and more. Um, I, girls with balls, just not... You know, again, I can see, if you've got a range of channels and you've got BBC Three, yeah. look, we have to hit the ground running at nine o'clock. Nine o'clock is our yeah. premium uh, slot and it's our priority slot. So we've got to think about the big, broad thing, but different ways in. And so... Uh, Single bombs? Single mum, super I, Look, I think it's, it's a fun tape, and sometimes tapes show um, 
attitude, comedic, insight, warmth, heart. I like tapes that show tone. I think it's too much of a slice of life for us, and I think it just won't work for the men in the audience as well. I mean, Long Lost Family is an incredibly female-skewing show, but men do watch it, and our strapline for this year is we want in the show that makes grown men cry, and that is our sort of marketing punch. I think, and I think we have a bit more leeway than you, so in a yeah. way for slots, so yeah. I think that that can work for us in a different way than it, it would be tough, I think, yeah. But just as a sort of, you know, Think of different way in, ways in. I mean, we're looking at. Uh, sorry, I know I'm supposed to be commenting on taste tapes, but you know what's out there. We're looking at the whole sort of science of DNA, but how do we do okay. DNA in an ITV way? So we do. We've got a sort of development, but we're doing something called Six Degrees of Coronation Street. I love the Coronation Street. I love the application of DNA to testing the ancestry and the roots of Cory, but are they related to each other as a family? Watch this space. So, you know, just bashing subjects out, what's out there and what can we bash it against to create something new and that changes the landscape a bit. Okay, Elisa, is there something else that you've seen here? That well, I'm in, I'm in line for the Manson. I mean, I would have, yeah, I mean, that's the idea of untapped archive cool on Simon a really Andrew well known. That later. On a really well-known subject, um, well, these girls killed for Manson. <laughs> would you have done EasyJet? Do you know what? I think we would have done, actually. I really Because I like the fact that it's all situated in that cockpit. I think there's something quite clever and unusual about that kind of like, unity of space. Quite well. It's good, so, yeah. quite young. Mm. So EasyJet, yes. Yeah. Uh, what about the lawyer? That I think he's an amazing character, um, and I would love to watch it, but I'm not sure if the... The subject matter that he's dealing with would appeal to our audience. When we go to America, we normally go for really, really universal subject matters. Mm. It would be tempting because he is an incredible character. I think it would be a bit of a risk for us. Okay. So, Claire, what about you? Is there, are there any tapes? I think the drag tape is great for BBC Three. I think that's really promising. Manson, yes, but I'd want it to sit up more, the resonance for now. You know, why... <coughs> I think you'll get that from the, the, from the, from the, the two-parter. You will get that, very much so. And it will be as part of the new crime and punishment strand, which is sort of something we really get behind and we push and we market. Would you yeah, have done Peter Files Wire? Oh, it looks interesting, yes. I didn't fully understand the taster, I'm really I know, sorry. Maybe we should have explained should what have it was beforehand. We did have thick. that debate. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, really, it's a really interesting idea and something that plays with form in that way of mm. getting at a story that you, um, that you can't get at is really interesting. Um, but I didn't okay. really understand it, sorry. Okay, no worries. Um, we're sort of almost at the end of uh, time, actually. Um, I don't know whether there are any um, final questions. Do we have time for questions? Can we have one question at all? <laughs> <laughs> one question? Okay, sorry, yes. Um, great panel, thank you all. Um, how are you responding to the likes of um, Amazon and Netflix? So oh, just that's a, a big question. Quick response, guys. <laughs> quick it's response. a big question. Are you worried, guys? Um, I think everybody is worried. I think that, um, yeah, it's a real challenge. I think that we are seeing, I'm saying earlier, I think we are seeing at 10 o'clock a real issue now. Um, where people are going to bed, putting a laptop on and seeing what's on Netflix. I think that will get more difficult when we get Sky on Netflix, uh, Netflix on Sky rather. So I think 10 o'clock, which is where we've been being uh, more concerned about being young, a little bit younger, a little bit edgier, Sex Business, Gangland 2, those kind of shows. I just think that that is, 10 o'clock is, is a difficult area, particularly with the fan kind of... Okay, so very quickly debate. guys, because um, we are really running out of time. Joe. Well, of course, we're mindful of, uh, of the complete shifts in the broadcast landscape um, as both competition and challenge. But opportunity, it shows that there's such a hunger for content. And so I think we have to be encouraged in a way by how much appetite there is for content everywhere. And each creates something that feels yeah. exciting and trumps what's out there. And the British like. story, really. Elisa. I think the thing is with Netflix, for example, they commission a lot and they've got a lot of money and that's very appealing. But I think if I was a program maker, I would worry that my program would get lost on Netflix. 
Whereas if you make a program for Channel 4, for example, we have the whole sort of marketing and press department and machinery that really promotes and loves your program. Perhaps that could be, that is our competitive advantage. Claire? I think there's a lot to be inspired by, you know, on Netflix in terms of storytelling and, and so on. But I also think that we have to keep the eye, our eye on the ball about what we're here to do, which is to hold a mirror up uh, in Britain and to, uh, uh, you, you know, and to help make sense of an increasingly complex world and that we have to do that um, first and foremost, I think. And I think there is a sort of, you get to a point of a sort of can be a tyranny of choice. It's really interesting. Mm. You can go to Sainsbury's Huge or Sainsbury's Local. I think it's, you know, there is a whole business, uh, you know, of actually making bespoke stuff, whether you're in retail or whether you're in telly. So I think absolutely hopeful, fantastic um, and okay. British focused. Well, look, th thank you very much, uh, panel guy, Joe, uh, Lisa, and Claire. Just give these guys a round of applause, yeah. Um, <laughs> that was